All right, praise God. Amen. Amen. Um, welcome to tonight's Bible study. And tonight we're going to be talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh and the tactics of Satan. Glory to God. Uh, this is going to be a first of a two or three part series. We, we're going to find out, depending on how long tonight goes, how long the week after next goes, and then we'll see. Whether it has to be in two parts or three parts. Because there's quite a bit of information that I'd like to give. I don't want to overwhelm any of you with inf with too much information. But when somebody has um, given so much misinformation about something for so long, it sometimes behooves us to dig deeper and try to get as much true information in order to counter the false information, praise God. And um, and as you notice in these Bible studies the past couple months, we are dealing with a number of what some people call difficult scriptures or um, scriptures that appear to make a loving God look like a pretty bad dude. And one of those scriptures, not because of the way it's been written, not because not even because of the way it's been translated, but because of the way people have misinterpreted and have incorrectly taught it. Um, it has made God to look um, pretty bad. Praise God. And that what scripture happens to be um, Paul's about Paul's so um, thorn in the flesh. What I'm going to be showing you tonight is not only the truth about this um, thorn, this traditional thorn that people say is so difficult to understand, but I'm going to be showing you how Satan uses certain tactics to um, get us to misunderstand the word of God. Hallelujah. But the first thing we're going to do is look at the text itself, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And it says in the text, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Praise God. Amen. Now, there are a number of lies that Satan has told concerning Paul's thorn in the flesh. You know, we do see that Paul had a thorn, praise God. And for numbers of years, not even, I won't even say years, for centuries, people have seemed to misunderstand this thorn that Paul had. And, um, and there's no real good reason why people have misunderstood it, but people have misunderstood it and people still continue to misunderstand it today. And I will say that anything that causes people to misunderstand the word of God based on a teaching that is in contrast or in contradiction to the word of God, they happen to have to come from Satan. Praise the Lord, because Satan is the original liar. And Satan does everything he can to get you off of God's word and to get you to disbelieve the word of God. So what we're going to um, look at some of the lies that Satan has told about this thorn in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And one of the biggest ones, one of the first ones I even heard about when I got saved was that the thorn was a sickness. So the thorn that Paul had was supposedly a sickness and it was a sickness sent by God. This is especially one of the scriptures a lot of um, people, you know, for those of us who believe in divine healing, we believe in, in, in deliverance ministry, we believe that God heals the day, we don't, and we teach against the idea that God inflicts sickness and disease and that healing that you can receive healing by faith. One of the first things that um, some of our critics counter us with 
is Paul's thorn in the flesh? Well, Paul was sick. He had a thorn in the flesh and God didn't heal him. So it must it must not be God's will to heal everybody. So that's one of the um, one of the lies that Satan likes to tell in order to destroy people's faith in the healing power of God or the will of God to heal. Um, another one, another lie that Satan has told about the thorn is that the thorn was a sin. Some kind of sin that Paul could never conquer or never get over. Praise God. That's pretty sad. But there are people who believe that Paul had some kind of he either had a sexual temptation that and that, and that's the claim that he hated women and all this other garbage. Um, but that's another lie that Satan is told concerning Paul's thorn. I guarantee you that Paul did not have that kind of struggle with sin that people claim he had. Praise the Lord. If he was, I mean, we all struggle with sin. And Paul himself said he struggled with certain things. But but Paul also pretty much tells us in all his epistles that he conquered any um, things of the flesh. And one of the things Paul, the Bible teaches us is that Paul did not have any issues with sexual temptation. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, Paul had a gift that he had that he did not need to get married. So this is a stupid lie that Satan is told and people believe it because they don't really read their Bibles fully. Another um, lie quite often told by uh, people and sometimes and all these lies are interacting sometimes. They, you know, they, some people will say that the, Paul, the thorn was a sickness or it was um, a sin. And they'll and they'll add this one in there that the thorn was sent by God. To keep Paul humble. And so this is what supposedly the thorn is. In, and the reason why people say that is because they misread the part where Paul says that I may not be so that I would not be exalted above measure. But you're going to find out that that um, statement by Paul has been misunderstood. And then another lie quite often told is that God denied Paul's request to have the, thro the thorn removed. That's not true, as we'll find out in this series. One of the funniest ones I find, and this is by scholars, theologians, people who are supposed to know way more than I know. People who have, have gone to school and have all kinds of letters behind their names. PhD, THD, LTT, period D, and are have doctor in front of their name and stuff like that. And these people say that the thorn is an unsolvable mystery. And this is something that even the greatest of theologians throughout the centuries have struggled with. So how dare you think that you know better than us? And then the last one is that is the idea from this thorn that God's people must remain passive when afflicted with difficulties. Because Paul had a thorn that God didn't remove even though he prayed. And so when you're confronted with a difficulty, you must simply accept your lot in life. And then one day when you get to heaven, God will help you to understand why you had to deal with what you had to deal with. Praise God. That's a lie. So, <laughs> and that's why we teach these things so that you won't be deceived um, when people try to throw these scriptures at you and tell you that you should not fight the good fight of faith, that you should not um, stand against the wiles of the devil, that you should not stand on the word of God and believe God for changes in your life and in your situations. Praise God. And um, and see, one of Satan's tactics against God's people is to use he will use scripture itself to mess up God's people's minds praise God so you, you when as we study Paul's thorn we can also look at how uh, the tactics of Satan and Satan takes a um, scripture like Paul's thorn a valid biblical God inspired scripture and twists the scriptures 
in order to get people to destroy people's faith. Praise the Lord. In order, Satan can use scripture to um, bring people into doubt and unbelief. And we see an example of this in the temptation of Jesus in the um, wilderness. In Luke chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, when Jesus is in the wilderness, Satan is trying to get Jesus, his, his own creator. You know, the Bible says that Jesus created all the angels, all the principalities and powers. Jesus is the creator of them. And Satan is trying to get his own creator to bow down and worship him. And he's twisting scripture in order to do this. And in um, Matthew chapter 4, verse 6, and it's also written in Luke 4, verses 10 through 11, it says, Satan says, saith unto him, And if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Now look at how Satan's quoting scripture, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Just, here is Satan trying to get Jesus to commit suicide. Trying to get Jesus to kill himself. Saying, try, by quoting scripture and saying, hey, if you jump down, the angels will catch you. See, Satan uses scripture to mess God's people up. Praise God. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen time and time again in my um Years of, of walking with the Lord, years of serving the Lord, I've seen people twist scripture to their own detriment. And one of the scriptures that Satan likes to twist out of the many, we've studied a lot of them, but one of those scriptures he loves to twist is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He likes to twist that scripture to make people believe that you can't fight against um the things that the difficulties in your life, that sickness can sometimes be God's will and God may not heal you, that um that you may, that God may give you something a sickness or a sin, imagine God Himself giving you a sin that you're going to struggle with. And if God gives you sin, then this is, this just maligns God's character, and that's just another tactic of Satan is to malign or to um, make God's character look degenerate. Praise God. So Satan you, he uses scriptures like um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 to malign the character of God. And I'm sorry I keep misquoting that passage. It's actually 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 y'all. So if you when you're taking notes, make that correction. And those of you who are watching the video, forgive me. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Praise God. But let's look at it again. The scripture again. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Now let me ask you, whose messenger was this thorn? Whose messenger? It's an open book test. The, the messenger of who? Satan. The messenger of who? Satan. The messenger of who? Satan. Thank you. Whose messenger it was? Uh, don't feel bad if you didn't understand it because the greatest of theologians seem, don't seem to understand it, even though it's sitting right there in the text. It says the messenger of Satan. I think Satan Satan really knows how to blind people to the plain teaching and reading of the scripture. You agree with me, mother? Amen. Yeah, yeah they just stopped somewhere and they said, and the way I hear people quote it, well, God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh. Yeah, yeah he's deceiving people, mother. <laughs> but let's let's do some comparison reading and then we can see how people read false ideas into the word of God. Now look, the scripture says there was given to me a thorn 
in the flesh. The messenger of Satan, that's all it says. It says nothing else. But what people say, notice what they usually say. There was given, God bless you, Martha. Welcome. What people, the way people read it is, there was given to me by God. This is the addition that people put into the scripture. There was given to me by God a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. So Satan, as I said earlier, he leads people to read their ideas into the text. In the um, academic world or in the debate world online, <laughs> when you're fighting with people, they, we, there's a saying, there's, there's, in the academic world, there's what is called exegesis. Um, what it means is being able to get into the, the biblical text, break it down, explain it, and understand it. But um, reading the text for what it says and then trying to understand it and explain it that way. But then there's another statement used in the academic world called eisegesis or asegesis. You don't have to remember these words. I'm just trying to show off my great vast knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, but eisegesis is reading something into the biblical text that's not even there. And that's what a lot of people do with 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. They read things into the text that's not even there. And these things are, act when people do that, and sadly, some of our preachers and teachers do this. Some of our um, seminary professors who are, pre who are um, teaching these people do that. And they are in violation of the word of God. I've put some scriptures down there in the, um, on the slide, Deuteronomy 4, 2, Proverbs 30 and 6, and Revelation 22, 16. Basically, these passages tell you that you are not to add to what God has said, nor are you to take away from what he said. And, and God condemns um, people twisting his word. How many of y'all hate it when somebody adds something to what you said that you didn't even say? <laughs> Don't that just tick you off? Oh, I'm going to tell you right now, it ticks me off big time when somebody does that to me. And it's been done to me. People have, you know, people have said, well, so-and-so said that you said. And I'm like, I didn't say that. Now, what I really said was this, but they added that. Or they forgot that I said this when I said that. And But that's what people keep doing to God's word all the time. And that's what they do to passages like um, first, second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Eve did that in the Garden of Eden. When you look at the scripture in, in Genesis chapter 3. And um, it says in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve adds to the word, and she says, well, we should not even, the, um, the Lord said we should not eat of it or nor touch it. God never told her not to touch it. <laughs> How is she not going to touch it? God, God told Adam and Eve that they are to tend the garden. Praise God. He simply said don't eat it. He didn't say nothing about touching it. You got to take care of it. Praise God. Amen. And then Satan, jumping down to verse 4 and 5, Satan goes and twists God's word and says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God know that in the day that ye eat thereof, your eyes will be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now Satan sat there and said that you shall not surely die. But what does God say? Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, God said, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. But what does Satan say? Ye shall not surely die. See, that's a twist on God's word, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Satan was able to twist God's word, and Adam and Eve believed what Satan said over what God said, and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, it's the exact same thing that we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 
God says there was a messenger or the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul says there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of who? The messenger of who? Satan. Satan. The messenger of Satan. That's all he says there. Satan adds to this. There was given to me by God a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan. As if God needs Satan to do his work for him. Now, as, um, I, as I said here in this um, slide, God and Satan are not working together. Amen. <laughs> God and Satan are not partners. They ain't bosom buddies. They ain't sitting around chumming, hanging out saying, hey, Satan, you know, um, I got a God down there who claims to be a Christian. I need you to um, send a couple of your demons after him and see if I can get him, get him to start being humble, you know. <laughs> Satan said, hey. Anything you need, Yahweh, I take care of you. I'm, I'm your boy. No, God, they ain't doing that. Praise God. <laughs> These are two enemies that are antagonistic towards one another. Glory to God. Amen. Now, somebody might say, but God is God. How can he how can somebody be his enemy? Well, God is God. He's the most powerful being in the universe. He's the creator of the universe. He even created Lucifer, who later became Satan. But God is not. Um. He does not go to war based on power. Praise God. As I've explained numerous times, if, if it was based on power, God could have destroyed Satan a long time ago. But the, the thing is not based on power. It's based on freedom. And God respects freedom. One day Satan will, will finally pay for all the evil that he's been doing. But that time hasn't come yet. And so God needs to see our, our love and respect for him. And we have to make choices. Glory to God. We either choose his enemy or we choose him. But Satan has his own kingdom. He has an agenda that's totally separated from God and is very much opposed and is in opposition to God's agenda. Glory to God. So God is not working along with Satan. So when we read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, we should not read any of any idea into it that God is is the one doing this. Praise the Lord. In Luke chapter 11, verses 15 through 20, um, we, it's not necessarily read the whole thing, you know, um, for the sake of time. But in Luke chapter 11, verses 15 through 20, and you can also, when you're taking those, write down Matthew chapter 12, it talks about the fact that Satan has a kingdom. And he, his kingdom is structured. It's not divided. Praise God. You don't have Satan working for God because working, his working for God will be working against um, all that he's trying to do to oppose God. So Satan's kingdom is at war with God's kingdom. And Satan is not divided against himself. Praise God. He's not um, doing things to help God out. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, God does not send devils to, in order to do his great work. Praise God. God doesn't need devils. As you as we um, if you were here when we were talking about um, Saul, the evil spirit that came from the Lord, we began to understand the fact that God is not the one sending evil spirits that murder and kill. Praise God. Because God. Satan, he doesn't need anything but God's loss of protection around the person. And then he attacks. So one of the other problems with this, though, is that uh, one of the lies that Satan tells is that God sent this thorn to keep Paul humble. And that's based on the fact that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, lest I be exalted above measure. But I want you to see from the you're going to see from the scriptures that God actually wants to exalt his people. Glory to God. But there and there is a godly exaltation. Say godly exaltation. There is a godly exaltation that God wants his people to have. See, in um, Romans chapter 12, Paul tells us that we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. See, 
God wants you to be humble, but he doesn't want you to beat yourself down. Praise God. Amen. You are a, the Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139. God wants you to think of yourself highly, just not more highly than you ought to think. Praise God. Amen. You are of value. God wants you to think of yourself as a value. He does not want you to think of yourself as degenerate or um, crazy or stupid or anything like that. Do you know that you were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? Amen. If you were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and for you to say some negative things about yourself, you are not only demeaning yourself, you are demeaning the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. When I came to realize that, I stopped. I learned to stop saying bad things about myself. Man, Troy, how can you be so stupid sometimes? Yeah, sometimes Troy can be stupid. Amen. <laughs> but I am not stupid. Praise God. Sometimes I might do some dumb things, but I'm not dumb. Glory to Jesus. I've been I've been bought with the precious blood of the lamb. And so now I begin to think of myself in the way that God sees me. So, and God wants to exalt his people. He wants to exalt his preachers. He wants to exalt his ushers. He wants to exalt the, bat, the, the person cleaning the bathroom. He wants to exalt everybody. Praise God. God wants to exalt you, not above himself, because you can't you can't get above him. Praise God. Amen. He don't want you to exalt. He don't. Want, and even as, as a pastor, God doesn't want me to be exalted above you. Hallelujah. Amen. People, any pastor who thinks that they're above the people don't understand what a pastor is. They've never seen a shepherd before. A shepherd is out there in the dirt and grime with stinky, smelly sheep. Praise God. <laughs> and that's what a, pa a pastor, the word pastor means shepherd. So there's no exaltation above the, anybody else. But God wants us to be exalted. Hallelujah. Amen. So one of the problems or the, one of the tactics of Satan is to confuse godly exaltation with pride. When there's a big difference between the two. My exaltation comes from God, so there's no pride in it. Pride comes only when I think that I've, done, I've achieved something by my own hand. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, that's one of the things God warned the Israelites against in, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and Deuteronomy chapter 15. God wants his people to be rich. Hallelujah. Amen. But he warns them against thinking that you got these riches by your own hand. And he and he rebukes his people for that. So that when I go, when you go to your job, you should be saying, "Thank you, Father, for this job. Thank you for getting me this job. Thank you for the um, for giving me the skills. Thank, and especially those of y'all who went to school, thank you, Father God, that you got me through this school. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But Satan's tactic is to get you and is to get you to confuse yourself with ex exaltation and pride. God wants to exalt you. He wants to promote you. He wants to promote you on your job. He wants to promote you in the church. He wants to promote you in your ministry. That, and when you recognize that God has done all that, you won't get proud. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's what God was trying to do with Paul. God actually was trying to exalt Paul. It was Satan that's trying to keep him from receiving that exaltation. But remember, God, as we said, God, he don't need demons to humble you. Praise Jesus. Amen. You, if, if demons are there messing with you, it's because you let them in, not because God did it. Amen. Amen. And it's because Satan, Satan is not in the business of helping God's servants to become humble. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> He's not in the business of doing that. Satan is trying to get you proud, not trying to get you humble. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Satan does not want God's servants to to be exalted. He don't want us he don't want us to receive the exaltation God has for us. And as we said it, there's a large and vast difference between pride and godly exaltation. God wants his servants exalted. Satan fights hard against that. And let me show you some scriptures that prove this point. Y'all should never believe anything I say. You should you should take the scriptures on these things. In 1 Peter Chapter 5, verses 5 through 6, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. In other words, submit yourself to the pastor. Man, Pastor Steve, you drove all the way up here, man. Good grief. 
God, God's going to bless you. <laughs> Amen. But he says, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. That means your pastor, praise God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, now, when, uh, and let me explain this real quickly because some pastors and some preachers like to use this pastor's scripture to get people to do any old kind of thing. That's not what it's talking about. Glory to God. Paul said it this way. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah, don't follow me as I follow me. You follow me as I follow me, I might get you in trouble. Praise God. Follow me as I follow Christ. Praise the Lord. So submit. So you submit to your pastor or the other elders as they are following Christ. Now, if, a pastor come, if any pastor comes and says, baby, you need to sleep with me. You do not submit to that man. Amen. Because he's not a man of God. Hallelujah. Amen. When the, when the pastor says you need to lie to get me out of trouble, then you you don't submit to that. Praise God. Amen. All right. Enough on that one. Yay. All of you be subject one to another. Say one to another. One to another. That means we all need to be sub. We need, we need to submit to one another. Glory to God. Amen. I need to submit to you. Praise God. Amen. You come to me with respect and you say, Pastor, you're wrong. The word of God says this. Guess what? I got to submit to you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And any pastor that, that's worth his weight in salt will submit to the word of God. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Now, it says, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Say humility. Uh, for God resisteth the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves. Say humble yourself. Humble yourself. Who does the humbling? Who does the humbling? We have to humble ourselves. Amen. Does God need demons to humble you? No. Does God need demons to humble you? No. Does God need Satan to work to humble you? No. Then, so then why do we misread 2 Corinthians chapter 12 to make it sound like God needed a demon to humble Paul? Praise God. Amen. God wanted Paul to humble himself. Now look at this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that, oh, I love this part, he may exalt you in due time. Amen. How many of y'all know that God wants to exalt you? Amen. When you humble yourself, God does the exalting. Praise the Lord. You don't, have to, you don't have to try to get prom fight for your promotion. You don't have to do the dog eat dog thing. See, it's Satan that's trying to keep you from this exaltation. Praise God. Amen. It's not God. Let's look at another passage in James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. It says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. How, how does God draw near to you? When you draw near to him. Praise Amen. God. It's reciprocal. Draw, draw away from God, he'll draw away from you. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves. Say, humble yourselves. Humble yourself. Who humbles you? Yes, sir. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you humble you. Praise God. Amen. Does God need demons to humble you? No. no. Who does he want to humble you? He wants you to humble you, praise God. Amen. But look at this. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. God wants to exalt you, praise God. Amen. He wanted to exalt Paul, praise God. God, it was a devil that was trying to keep Paul from, being, from receiving the exaltation that he needed. Because when God exalts you, then he's able to reach more people for, through you. For, praise God. Amen. God wants more people into the kingdom. So he needs to exalt you in order so that he can reach others through you. Amen. He can't. It's hard to reach people when you're down and, 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 and in the dirt and ain't got nothing. That, that, um, but you can tell people, I love Jesus. You want my savior? Man, people ain't going to want your savior. Praise God. You can't, you ain't, you can't even save yourself. <laughs> All right. But 
Jesus, he also makes um, these similar statements in several parts of the gospel. And I showed you, I got references up there, Matthew 23, 12, Luke 14, 11, 18, 14. Jesus always talks about how when we humble ourselves, we will get exalted. Praise the Lord. So God wants to exalt you. So contrary to popular theology, God actually wants to exalt his servants. And when God exalts you, there's no pride involved Amen. because you and I have to humble ourselves in order to receive God's exaltation. Glory to God. Amen. And so, as I stated down below, this puts a whole new light on the passage where um, Paul says that the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Satan sent that messenger to keep Paul from receiving the exaltation he needed. Praise the Lord. So, as we say here, Satan, he didn't want Paul to receive the exaltation that God wanted to give him. That's why the message of Satan was, it was not sent by God to make Paul humble. We saw that God is the one who wants us to humble ourselves. So, Satan sent this messenger to keep Paul from sharing the abundance of revelation that God had given him for the church and the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul had an abundance of revelation and the revelation wasn't for Paul. They wasn't to make Paul look good. They were meant for Paul to be exalted so that he will be able to share the goodness of God. Glory to God. Amen. Oh, Paul wrote um, at least one third of the whole New Testament. Most of the New Testament was written by Paul. And um, and we preach from these from Paul's books. Glory to God. Amen. They're inspired scripture. They're blessed to us. You get the most under, the greatest understanding of what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection by reading Paul's um, epistles. Glory, glory to God. And so, obviously, these God-given revelations were meant to do more damage to Satan's kingdom. That's another thing Paul's books do. They show you how Satan is defeated. Hallelujah. Amen. How, you, how Satan is under your feet. Satan didn't want people to be knowing about all that. That's why he was trying to keep Paul down. Amen. So Satan was scared of having these things um, revealed to the world and to the body of Christ. And that's why he sent the messenger of Satan to attack Paul. Praise God. Amen. So that's um, the understanding that you and I should receive from um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Um, we're going to learn more next week. We're going to be talking about more things. The, that understand this truth, you know, because Satan, he also tries to tell us that the thorn was sickness. We're going to show you that that's not true. Paul, um, he tries to tell us that God wouldn't refuse to deliver Paul from the thorn, that he denied Paul's request, his prayer. And that's where some people get the idea that God sometimes says no to your prayer request. And you're going to find out um, next week that's not true either. Praise God. Amen. God wants to answer your prayers and he your prayers for healing your prayers for deliverance Amen. God desires to answer those your prayers for your children's salvation Amen. God desires to answer all those hallelujah Amen. none of those are, are denied by God if if we don't get an answer to prayer it's not that God said no he just simply didn't answer praise God because all God's answers are yes if if um when I don't get an answer to prayer I'm not going to look to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7 and say, oh, well, God didn't answer Paul's prayer, so I guess he won't answer mine. That's stupid. That's a misunderstanding of the scriptures. What I need to do is look and say, okay, did I mess up somewhere? Am, am I in unforgiveness? Did I, did I base what I'm asking God for on a scripture? Is what I'm wanting a selfish request? Praise God. Sometimes we want, to, we want God to do stuff just so we can... Uh, spend it on ourselves or it, it just does us only for only for our good we don't care about our neighbor down the street praise God some of y'all want a million dollars so that you can go on vacation and have a good time and travel the world you ain't even thinking about missionary work you just think about traveling the world <laughs> so I want I want God to put a hot million dollars in my hand praise God so that I can be a blessing to others hallelujah I might give my wife a little bit of money of it, you know, but <laughs> but, the rest, but, it's all, but most of it is going to be used for Christ. Praise God. 
Amen. Uh, so, we'll stop right here. Are there any questions? Complaints? Ideas? Suggestions? Comparisons? <laughs> Second Corinthians, yeah, Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse seven. We're going to be breaking down several, several of the passages in Second Corinthians twelve, but we started off with that one tonight. That that's the foundational one. Given to me. Was given to me. The of Satan. The I don't know why. Yeah. Well, we started out. See, see, that's what happens when you come late. But, uh, but we know you. We know you travel a long way, so we. So, so we'll forgive you. But yeah. No, we started out. Um. The uh, the fact is, is that. Within Christendom, for the past several centuries, people have claimed that that thorn in in Paul's flesh was a mystery, and some people have said that it was sickness. Uh, some people have said that it was a sin that Paul just never could conquer. But all of them believe that the the thorn was sent by God. You will even find people on the internet, on YouTube, and everywhere today still saying that God gave Paul. A thorn in the flesh and so we read the scripture and we saw how people actually read into the scripture the idea that God gave Paul the thorn when it specifically says that it was a messenger of Satan how people get the idea that God sent this thorn when it specifically says it's a messenger of Satan is really strange but that's what we were breaking that down tonight and we're showing how God and Satan are are not bosom buddies hanging out, chilling out together and trying to figure out how to mess people up. That God and Satan are opposed to each other. God is for you. Satan is against you. Praise God. Amen. And that's and um and so we were showing how people have misunderstood that scripture. And so and a lot of people use that scripture even today to attack those of us in churches like these where we believe that God uh, it's God's will to heal, to deliver, to set people free. And um, and people will use that scripture to say, well, it's not God's will to heal everybody. Look at that. Paul had a thorn in the flesh and God didn't answer his prayer and God didn't relieve him from sickness. So there's an assumption right there that the thorn was sickness, even though the scripture doesn't say that. And so we're going to deal more with the sickness part of it next week. But um, but there's so many assumptions placed on that text or read into that text. And many of them are by scholars, theologians, people who teach in our seminaries and bring and, and send out preachers who teach the same lies. And so that's what we were dealing with that tonight. I'm just giving you a nutshell of all that we talked about. And we looked at a number of scriptures that um, refute the points or the mistakes or the lies of the devil in that area. Praise God. So, what I'm trying to say that even though this stone was given to Paul and um, his rights to humble him, but I think God um, allowed us to receive more of revelation when we are humble. Because they, they the race of us being proud when you have your people, I'm not saying that it's God that gave this tone in the flesh, but I'm just saying that when we seeking to have more of God, we seeking to have more revelation, we should know that one of the criteria should be that we should be humble. But it doesn't mean that we should go to the way and read the passage as well. He said he knew a man that was caught in the paradise. I think Paul was talking about himself. Yeah, a lot of people believe that. It, there's no yeah, there's no reason not to believe it. Yeah, yeah. so he was talking about himself. So 
He just that he didn't want to, I think he didn't want to glorify him to us. Maybe just knowing that I'm the one who gave him this revelation. I don't want to say he said, I, I, I knew a man. So we who are striving for more of God, glory in our life, more of doing great things and God uh, give us um, um, the grace to do marvelous things and great things in the best thing is to be humble. Oh yeah. Uh, we have a master Jesus. Right. Humble himself. Yeah. And that that goes beyond that that's definitely goes beyond a shadow of a doubt. We you don't you don't get anything from God. Apart from humility, praise the Lord. But as we saw from the scriptures, God's way of humbling us is for us to humble us. It's a decision. God should never have to force you to hum um, to be humble. You should be able to say, you know what? I've decided I'm going to walk in humility. It's just like forgiveness, love, anything else that God um, has commanded us to to have it's a decision for me to forgive I can't wait for when you hurt me I can't wait for a supernatural manifestation of God's power to cause me to finally say okay I forgive that person I have to make up my mind that oh that person hurt me but I, you know what I'm not going to hold it against them praise God Amen. and the same thing with humility I've got to make up my mind you know what because if, if, if demons could cause us to be humble then this Bible study should be full right now, praise God. Because we know a lot of people that have come into this church, they've gotten attacked by demons, and they ain't nowhere near humble. <laughs> they've, they've gotten mad at God. They've stuck their middle finger up at God, so to speak. This, and they, and they stuck, their heads are stuck in the air because God did this to them. Demons, cannot, um, demons don't necessarily make you humble. That, matter of fact, their job is to try to get you in pride. Hallelujah. <laughs> Satan wants you to be proud like him. That's why God said, "Don't put a novice in a, uh, as an, as a leader in the church unless they fall into the condemnation of the devil, which is pride." Praise God. So we so we uh, that's why that that passage it has to be read carefully and in context with the rest of the Bible. Certainly, that's that's what this we're here for. So in this sense, what it means to be humble? What does it mean to be humble? Yeah. Everybody, it's humble. What do we think? Being humble. Well, if we wanted to get a a detailed Bible study on that, that would definitely be for another time. But in a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But humble. humble a, a, a simple definition of humble or humility is to submit, be submissive to whatever God says and to do it and to be obedient. Praise God. Is Whenever we think, whenever we disobey God, we think that we're bigger and better than God. We think that we know more than God. We're exalting ourselves. When I do what God tells me to do, I'm being humble. When God tells me to love you, I'm being humble. When God tells me to, to treat you like I treat myself, I'm being humble. Unless I treat myself like dirt, then, <laughs> then maybe I should change that. But but as I love, that's why it says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. If I love me, I should love you just the same. So humility is simply doing what God says. If you look at James chapter 4. He talks about the fact that we are to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. And then he talks about humbling yourselves, and then the Lord will lift you up. Praise God. So that's all it is, is, is submission to God, being obedient to God, doing whatever God says. And when I do what God says, I'm never going to mistreat anybody else. I'm always going to love people. Praise the Lord. Amen. I also want to add that um, being homo is a um, total submission to God and not taking credit for gift that God has given you mm -hmm. to be able to help other people. And you all have, you have to always give him the credit. Give him the glory. 
That's Amen. that's definitely a good definition. Uh, mm-hmm. Pastor Mary, those are, those are good questions you're asking. So we, <laughs> we I, I want you to understand that we I love those kind of questions. Amen. So because um they challenge me, but <laughs> Amen. No, no, they they do. Those are good. Those are very. You asked some very very good questions tonight. And um, Pastor Steve, that was an excellent um explanation or addition as well. But um hum, humility. When we have humility, God will exalt you, as the scripture says. He will do the exalting. Any other questions? Anybody have any other questions? I think we can see um, humility also in Jesus Christ. Oh, definitely, yes. Because after he had preached everything, after he had done everything, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, was supposed to do Mm-hmm. Arrest him. He humbled himself and gave himself up. Mm. And then well, they stand there and say, Who do you think? You come in. <laughs> I'm the preacher. So yeah. you can just come and get me. I mean, he, hum- he forgot about his title, the authority, his name, everything forgot about it. Mm. And submit to what. The purpose for which God has called him to come. Amen. That's being humble, I think so. Yeah. But sometimes we, well, we have some names also. Sometimes Titles, we come, yeah. Uh, us. We look at the title and don't see who has given us the title to follow the purpose for which we are called in that um, office or what God has called us. We are only looking at the title and not looking at the title of the yeah. so, to the death of the cross. Death to the cross. That was yeah. a shameful death. A disgraceful death. In, in who wants to go through disgrace by being humble? Mm. There's another. Well, who wants to be disgraced? Because that was a disgrace. For death, according to the Roman history, yep. at that time, that you should be hung on the cross. Which one of us, if anyone, will be disgraced for the name of Jesus Christ? We rather need, we rather, by Jesus' name, be disgraced and be blasphemed by the heathen. Then we preserve our integrity. So humble to be humble. As the Bible says, you have to be this decision, you should make it. But that means you dying to yourself, you dying to your name, you dying to your fame, you dying to your career, you just submitting to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nothing to boast about. Yeah. You don't like saying you're dying, you just say God. Yeah. And, oh, and the Bible does specifically say in Philippians chapter 2 that he humbled himself. He did not. He did not um, concern himself with the, his equality with God, but humbled himself even to the death of the cross. That's. He's the perfect example of humility. If we want to look at humility, we follow our Lord Jesus. He's the perfect, perfect example of what it means. He, God, the Creator of heaven and earth, humbles himself to our level and dies on the shameful cross for us. And, you know, um, you know, as Pastor Mary was talking about titles and stuff like that, uh, you probably, I think I said this before y'all came, but sometimes people might wear the title pastor without knowing the origin of the word, which the origin is simply shepherd. And shepherd was out there all night and day in dirt, dirty fields with smelly, stinky sheep. That wasn't the most, um, that was no exaltation right there, praise God. Or that wasn't an, an, an exaltation in the eyes of man, I should say. To have to care for sheep, clean up clean up after sheep, clean up their mess, feed them. <clears throat> um, when people understand what a pastor is, 
you won't get so high and mighty about it. Praise God. You'll understand that you're out there trying to help sheep. Glory to Jesus. Now, one to ask him that to, to be humble, you really have to be somebody who know God and to give yourself to really be humble. Like, um, I believe example was I reading an article, one of the most conservative presidents they ever hired who was Reagan, the Republican woman. He was very old, he was one of the oldest presidents to be elected here. Reagan? And, yeah. yeah. Ronald Reagan, yeah. Okay. He was shot in the hospital while in the in his bed he was going in the bathroom and then the water that was there, he spit the water on the floor. So he took the floor right according to the article, he was wetting the floor right when the next he said, Oh Mr. President, you want me to lose my job? He said, No, I made a mess, I have to clean it. Mm. So he never thought of the title or his age. But he discipline, showing himself as a conservative, a Christian man who loved Christ. He decided to do everything but not to depend on title or maybe or all of the To our leader, we have to show that we are humble for other people to see, to follow us. Amen. Amen. Yep. You got to be the example because Christ was the example. Uh -huh. Yeah. He washed the feet of like, oh, yeah, good point, Sister Taco. Yes, Jesus, Jesus showed that humility when he washed his disciples' stinky, smelly feet. <laughs> Man, that's the, that would even be hard for me to do. But <laughs> I know pastors that do it though. So that you know, we got good pastors out there. They actually have foot washing services. I don't know. If, you know, there's been a debate about whether. That should be contained in the church today. Um, but we didn't say we have to do. Yeah, that's that's where a lot of. Show the disciple how no, yeah. no. And, and I'm still you well, know, I'm still trying to figure out whether we really should do it or not. Um, we can do it the other way. We can do it directly. Yeah. Or we do it in an other way that can show that we might even be going beyond that. Mm -hmm. There are some things you are doing. You you do for your own man there. Yeah. You don't have to wash your feet there. But if you, you, I, you know what? If you're right, I sure won't have a problem with that one. <laughs> you know, we used to have the foot wash services when I was in the um in Japan. We I think we only had them a couple of times, and pastor my pastor finally just stopped them. But you know, it was funny. We all running around washing each other's feet. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, but it was still a beautiful time. Even if we were wrong, God still blessed that time because of our hearts, and um, and we just cared about each other, and we just wanted to show each other how much we loved each other. So we just go wash each other's feet, especially if there was somebody in the church you was kind of ticked off with. You had to make sure that you really went to that person. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we've been mad at each other. Can I wash your feet? <laughs> Praise God. Anybody else have anything? We, we're almost out of time, but um, we want to give everybody opportunity for questions or or statements or anything, any insights. How you doing back there, Mama? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Pastor Mary. Now his name is gone, but his name and legacy again, again, laid forever and ever. I don't know. I just speculated maybe people are glory and God is pride. But it was Satan who was doing that, not God. Yeah. Well, one thing for sure, God is able to take anything that Satan does and turn it around for His glory if we let Him. But it, there's a part that we got to play in all of that. Because, um, like I said, if Satan is if if Satan is able to the the um the work and do certain things, this church should be filled to the. I mean, we this is a, the we got a pretty good Bible study night. A lot of y'all here. Huh? Best probably the best week we've had in a long time. But um, 
But we shouldn't have any empty chairs, praise God, if Satan is um, is working for God in that in, in the sense that, he, that his work brings glory to God in every aspect. But the fact is, is that most people are no longer serving the Lord because Satan has been successful in his antagonism towards God. And he's destroyed many lives because people have not yet learned how to resist the devil and f so that he will flee from them. But God, um, God desires our exaltation. He desires us to be blessed, but our exaltation won't come apart from our humility. But the thing is that Satan can do a lot of things, but if we submit ourselves to God, God can turn that whole thing around as if it was almost like it, as if it was his plan all along for that thing to happen. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused because like for a good example is how many of us got saved. I got saved because there was a strong need in my life. I had no money, no house, no car, and a pregnant wife all the way in Japan. And no way to get her to the United States in time before she had that baby. Um, and they, the, the Japanese embassy was giving her a hard time about getting her passport and visa and all that stuff. Her And um, I didn't know what to do. I was at my wit's end. I have no choice but to go to God. Now, I could not, but I did have two choices. I could have been mad at God because of all my situation. I could have said, why you put me in this God forsaken place away from my wife with no money, no car, no house. God, I'll never serve you. There's a lot of people that do that. On the other hand, you could decide, you know what? I ain't got no choice now. God, I need you. I took the second choice. Praise God. And God worked. I mean, I told God, I said, God, if you take care of this for me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Next day, I mean, the next day, you know, sometimes we ask God to do some things and sometimes it takes him weeks, sometimes months. This happened the next day. Everything started coming into place. Get a letter from her. They taking care of her. They, she's getting her um, visa and passport. Um. Found a way to get me a house, got me a car, got the got the money I needed. Um, everything just started happening. Praise God. And what Satan meant to use to destroy me, God turned around and brought me into His kingdom. Praise God. Amen. And after you know, after the, when God did all that, I kept my end of the deal. Said, okay, you know what? Um, you did a great thing. And in return, you get in a mess, but you, you know, <laughs> it's not much of a bargain. You get in a, you get in a messed up guy for all the good things you did. But um, if this is what you want, you got me. Praise God. So Satan, he'll tell, he can do things with his intention to destroy. But he's a fool because God can take everything that Satan does and turn it around for his glory. Hallelujah. And that's the lesson we should we should be learning from these um, from the Bible, how the God is a resourceful God who can take Satan's work and and um, and turn it around and make things better for you and me. But as they always say, there's no victory without a battle. And the battle is won. Amen. Any other questions, statements, complaints? If not, going once. <laughs>